You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services. Nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may May allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Shop Lowe's this Labor Day for great buys to help you enjoy your outdoors a great deal more. Freshen up your landscape with premium mulch. Now five bags are just $10. And if you're having people over to celebrate the holiday weekend, be prepared to grill with a two-pack of Kingsford charcoal now for just $9.88. All projects have a starting point. Start with Lowe's. Mulch offer valid 830 through 913. Charcoal offer valid 831 through 94. Limit two per customer. While supplies last, selection varies by location. U.S. only excludes Alaska and Hawaii. Since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the united action of prayer. 
which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. We would like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home, on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory? Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do. And join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can leave, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Schrader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. I want to remind our listeners that if you would like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show, you should check out our websites, CCRS Network and CCR Show, both dot coms. You can also go to Red Nation Rising Radio and Red State Talk Radio, again, both dot coms. And you don't even need a computer or a radio to listen to Conservative Commandos. You can listen to us anywhere if you just have a phone. You can dial this number, 832-999-1199, and listen in to the Conservative Commandos that way as well. So there's no excuse for not listening, no excuse for missing. Uh, one of our goals is to make sure that as a, um, 
at Red Blooded America and you have the information you need to make sure America continues to be the sort of bastion of liberty that our founders envisioned. Now, I have already told you we have a great guest coming up, and we do. I'm going to introduce him now. His name is Jonathan Wood. He is an attorney. Um, he's actually lead attorney on a major case being uh, handled by the Pacific Legal Foundation. It's the Massachusetts Lobstermen's Association versus Ross case. Now, I don't expect you to know all the names and necessarily be, you know, up on that. But let me just first finish introducing Jonathan Wood, and then we're going to jump into the case. I n guarantee you, even if you are not an avid uh, appreciator of lobster, you still will be interested in this case because of the property rights and other uh, kind of government overreach issues. Uh, so, so don't let the uh, you know name of the case. That's how cases are. They always have names that don't necessarily suggest their import. But uh, as I said, Jonathan Wood is. Um, he specializes in environmental law and constitutional law. He is a member of the Pacific Legal Foundation's Environmental Practice Group, and he litigates a variety of cutting-edge issues um, under the Endangered Species Act, a Clean Water Act, uh, a lot of state and federal environmental laws, and uh, he does uh, television, radio, print outlets. He's been on Fox and Friends, New York Times, um, Washington Post, National Review, Reason, etc., and they are constantly fighting for our constitutional rights, make sure, in this case, it sounds like uh, a lot of property rights and, and making sure that the government doesn't run roughshod over us in, the, in, in their uh, zeal uh, to, quote, protect the environment. I'm a b firm believer you can protect the environment and respect people's rights at the same time, and I know Jonathan is too. Jonathan, welcome to the Conservative Commandos. Thank you for having me. Let's jump in. Tell us about this case. I mean, um, you know what's what's at stake here? Why would someone who is a uh, uh, an educated, um, informed voter, uh, someone who wants to see America live up to the promise of the Constitution and and the principles therein, uh, why would they care about this case? Uh, because it is a uh, a case that raises a clear rule of law issue. We're fighting back against presidential overreach done by the Obama administration that threatens people's ability to pursue their livelihoods and protect the environment. Uh, just before President Obama's final term ended, he designated a 5,000-square-mile section of the Atlantic Ocean to be the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. Uh, to get a sense for just how much, how big that is, 5,000 square miles is roughly the size of Connecticut. So President Obama declared that that entire area would be off-limits to commercial fishermen, including our lobstermen clients, who have relied on the area for, to pursue their work for years. The problem, uh, at least for the Obama administration, and that the Trump administration is now going to have to figure out what to do with, is that the Antiquities Act expressly limits monument designations to, quote, land owned or controlled by the federal government. For 100 years, presidents respected this limit and never designated any monuments in the ocean. But it's only in the last 10 that suddenly presidents decided that words don't have to mean anything, and they can say the ocean is land, and even if it's outside the United States, it's owned and controlled by the federal government. And here, this monument is more than 100 miles from our coast. So we do not that, own it. So we you do mean not the control. president of the United States, um, Barack Obama, previous president, um, didn't pay attention to the rule of law, and I mean I. I'm being facetious, but it's like this it seems to me like he woke up in the morning asking himself at times, how can I violate the principles of the Constitution and violate the rule of law? Um, I'm Perhaps I'm bitter, but as an organization that was targeted by the IRS, um, and um, I feel like that was likely – you know, approved at the White House. I don't mean necessarily my organization, but the whole operation of using and weaponizing the IRS, it just seems so symptomat so systematic that it's unlikely it was just one or two rogue employees in uh, Cincinnati. Um, but so basically we have a law. Isn't there another provision of the Antiquities Act, by the way, that suggests that it needs to be small parcels? He just can't name. Isn't it kind of, if, as I recall? That's exactly that, right. So I don't the, know. Is the statute expressly required. <laughs> yeah, certainly not. I mean, it's it, it, to put it in terms of what land would be. It's well over 1.3 million acres. 
Yeah, that doesn't sound small. But as you, yeah, as you mentioned, the statute also expressly says that monuments must be, quote, the smallest area compatible with protecting the antiquity or the object that forms the basis for the monument. We really just have a complete mismatch between what Congress was doing when it passed the statute in 1906 and what presidents are abusing their power to do today. Um, I, to convince people, to explain to people just how large the scope of the problem of Antiquities Act abuse is, I think it's best to think about the first hundred years of presidents that use their power in the statute designated a total of around 70 million acres. The last two on their own have designated over 700 million. So you've got a tenfold increase in just under 20 years. That's stunning to me. Um, so, um, what is the you know what's the pushback? How do you solve this problem? Uh, well, you you start by suing. And uh, earlier this year, PLF filed a lawsuit on behalf of five commercial fishing organizations from throughout the Northeast who saw their livelihoods threatened by this monument designation. Um, we are waiting for the government to respond to that lawsuit. It's been slowed down a little bit because as your listeners may know, President Trump, acknowledging that this Antiquities Act abuse has been happening, ordered the Department of Interior to review all of the large monuments designated over the last 20 years and make recommendations about whether or not to revoke them, shrink them, or change their regulations. Now, what's the status of that? Because I thought I read an article where it looked like there wasn't going to be a wholesale revision. That was basically going to be um, relatively minor. And when I read the article, it, I found that a little disappointing because I didn't know that the abuse was as bad as the statistics you just stated but I knew it was bad. And so I kind of mm -hmm. thought, good, when they review this, they'll overturn as much of this as possible and get it back toward the realm where it should have been. And um, I'm a little worried that sometimes that what it happens is, you know, once you move the, the ball, you can never move the ball back. Um, is mm -hmm. that true or is, 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 am I misunderstanding what's going on? Uh, it, it's really hard to say. No one really knows outside the administration what they're thinking about doing. Uh, on Thursday, the Department of Interior issued a press release saying they'd given recommendations to the White House, but they didn't disclose what the recommendations were for any of the 27 individual monuments subject to the review. And ultimately, it's up to the president. Um, whatever the department recommends, it's President Trump alone gets to decide whether to revoke a monument or, or shrink it. He's not bound by those recommendations. So right now, really all we have to go on are rumors and press reports, and some of them are suggesting that we probably won't see any monuments revoked, but we'll see a handful, four or five, substantially reduced. And the latest rumor is that Bears Ears out in Utah will likely be reduced by about 90%. Interesting. Well, that would be significant. I mean, then the, the press report that I read was probably um, not very accurate. Um, that's shocking in today's world that when you read something in the press, you can't rely on it entirely and just assume that it's true. Um, so I'm glad you're here to, to educate us on that because this is an important issue. I know that uh, right now in the news, you've got things like, um, the, you know, freedom of press is a big issue and you've got people uh, – arguing that we should have safe spaces and people shouldn't have to be confronted with ideas they don't want to hear and all that. And it kind of strikes me as odd, but, but property rights are a fundamental part of what makes America a tremendously um, free country. It's just people sometimes think that it's free speech that does it. I'm, I love free speech. It's awesome. So I'm not suggesting it's not important. All I'm saying is we sometimes forget, I know you don't, but sometimes as Americans, we forget the importance of our economic freedom rights. I know we've got to go to break right now, but when we come back, let's pick up on that idea of, of how important these economic rights are, and, um, and we will uh, continue this conversation with Jonathan. Thanks so much for being with us. I want to remind our listeners that you are listening to the Conservative Commanders Radio Network, and, of course, we are coming to you around the world, not just where we have actual physical stations, including in Florida and Georgia, Wisconsin, California, Nevada, Pennsylvania, but uh, around the world, thanks to Al Gore's amazing Internet. Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeartRadio, MFN 24-7. Do not go away. We 
We'll be right back. Since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the United Action of Prayer which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. We would like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home? on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory. Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can leave, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. We will continue the great conversation we've been having with Jonathan. It's been uh, both interesting. It's been, uh, I think, uh, 
even to me illuminating, and I'm the host of the show. So if someone else is, uh, hasn't been illuminated by this, then I, you know, they're, they're doing pretty darn good. But at any rate, just want to remind you guys, if you want to hear a rebroadcast, if you missed a second, you came in, someone called you and interrupted you during the show, no excuse for not hearing the whole thing. You can go to our website, CCRS Network, CCR Show. You can also go to Red Nation Rising Radio, and you can go to Red State Talk Radio, all dot coms. And with your phone and this number, you can always listen in, 832-999-1199. We have been talking with Jonathan Wood. He is a a senior attorney, lead attorney with the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. They do great work protecting constitutional um, rights. He uh, ex- he's, he's an expert in environmental law and constitutional law. And we've been discussing a case involving uh, and pushing back against an abuse of the Obama administration when they tried to declare a, a part of the ocean about 100 miles out that's the size of Connecticut a, a, a monument under the Antiquities Act. And at least on several different uh, levels, this violates the clear terms of the uh, Antiquities Act, and we've been talking about that. So thank you, Jonathan, for spending your time with us. Now... We were just before the break talking about the importance of economic rights, and uh, you're a constitutional lawyer. I've taught constitutional law. I, I know you understand, but why is it that an economic right isn't just money? In other words, sometimes people think like you know, freedom of religion and freedom of press and freedom of speech, those are foundational American values. Economic rights, ah, it's just money. It's not as important. I mean, yeah, I like that, but it's not the same. I would argue it's every bit as important as the three I just named because they work together hand in glove to make sure that Americans enjoy liberty and freedom. What say you? I think that's exactly right. Economic freedom and property rights are the foundation for most of our freedoms. It's it's how we protect our dignity. If you go and ask most people what they do, the first thing they're going to tell you is their job because so much of our identity is wrapped up in what we do to provide for ourselves and our family. And if you don't have the right to go out and pursue the occupation of your choice or, you know, continuing to provide for your family, that is a huge blow that is on on a par with restricting your speech rights and other important constitutional rights. One thing I've also noticed, just to add to what you said, because I agree with you 100% on that, um, some countries, like the former Soviet Union, had a guarantee of free speech in their constitution. Of course, they didn't mean it, but um, the real way they controlled the populace, I mean, I guess the people who aggravated the most ended up in gulags. But for most people, they didn't have to threaten them with gulags. They could control them through economics because you had to wait in line for everything, and if you wanted a new washing machine or a new apartment or anything like that, you had to curry favor with the government. And therefore, that became the way that um, everyone understood, if I want to continue to be able to get the things that I want, the things that my family needs, then I better curry favor with the people in power. And that's not how America works. We all have the right to say, I think, you know, the old joke Ronald Reagan told about, you know, one of the great things about America is I can stand up and say, uh, you know, I think Ronald Reagan's doing a terrible job. And the Russian says, oh, I can say that in my country too. I can do the exact same thing. I can go right into the, the Kremlin and, you know, and, and say, I think Ronald Reagan's doing a terrible job. But it ended there, in other words. You, you know, they couldn't actually say, I think that the uh, Secretary General's doing a terrible job. And um, in America, you can. And, and um, but that's partly not just because of free speech. It's because we're economically not dependent on the government. And um, things like this, this case here, seems designed to make it more and more difficult uh, through property rights and, prop- and, and, and economic rights to make it for uh, fishermen to make a living. So wh- how is this case pro- progressing? Tell us about it. What's going on? So as I said, we filed the complaint several months ago. We're waiting for the government to respond. They asked the court for a six-month delay while they pursue um, the review that that just finished. Um, And at the time, they explained that um, it it didn't make sense to litigate this case if they were going to revoke the monument or do something that uh, might change the situation and resolve the problem. And that still might happen. As I said, we don't know um, what the department has recommended, but whatever they have, the president has unconstrained authority to do whatever he likes. He could revoke the monument. He could lift all of the fishing restrictions and let these people get back to work. And until we know what he's going to do, the the case will remain uh, sort of 
on pause, but as soon as that happens, and if the restrictions remain in place, the monument continues to exist, the government will have to go back to court and try to come up with some legal argument to make the ocean land. And that really is the challenge. You mentioned earlier about how some of the most oppressive countries in the world have the best language in their constitutions. Our founding fathers took a similar approach. They understood that it was important to have a written constitution and have have that language to protect people, but ultimately they're only parchment barriers unless people hold the government to account. If the law is clear, you cannot let the government violate it for political expediency's sake, and that's what President Obama did with these ocean monuments. The statute expressly limits monuments to land owner controlled by the federal government. It doesn't matter how much you might like the result of protecting the ocean. This was illegal. You know, that's a good point. Sometimes we look at policy, we say, I like the results, so it's good. And you made a very important distinction. If you appreciate the rule of law, you don't just look at the result. You look if, if the if the thing that was done was legal and not just asking, us, do I like that? And um, we, we're, we're going to run out of time, so I don't want to spend too much time talking myself about this. I want to ask you this question. Um, Sometimes people say things like, oh, we we got to cut back on this fishing because, you know, fishermen, they're ruining the environment. Uh, I, I've never understood that argument. Why would fishermen want to ruin the environment where they're going to make their living? And, and and so why is it that people sometimes foolishly, particularly on the left, seem to act as if people um, like fishermen are somehow these not – these, you know, poor stewards of the um, of the resource? Mm -hmm. I mean, a part of it, I think, is there is a knee-jerk reaction from members of the left environmental community. Um, I don't think it's true of all environmentalists. I, I consider myself a more libertarian-leaning environmentalist, but I think the, the left part of that the spectrum does have a knee-jerk reaction against anything that looks like productive use of it, they, that they can characterize as greed. And so there's an automatic skepticism, uh, but ultimately you're right. Fishermen have a, a strong incentive to ensure that their fisheries remain sustainable because if they don't, they're going to lose their jobs or the children aren't going to have something to inherit. And so if you look over the last few decades, um, fishermen throughout the United States have worked very closely with regulators and environmentalists to develop mechanisms to ensure that our fisheries remain sustainable, and most of them are rebounding very, very quickly, including the area that has been locked off. So the reason why environmentalists wanted the Northeast Canyons Monument designated is because it's, quote, pristine with lots of thriving uh, fish species. It's been fish for 50 years. The reason why it's pristine is because fishermen have taken such good care to protect it. I think that's a very important point, and I see that happening all over the place when – uh, environmentalists, and I would say the extreme environmentalists, because I agree with you. I'm a scout master. I, I love to go camp. I like clean water. I like clean air. I like beautiful vistas. Show me an American who doesn't like those things and doesn't support those things. I think the truth is every American cares about the environment. Uh, sometimes when people tell you I'm an environmentalist, what they're really saying is I have this odd ideology where I put, you know, where it it just gets out of hand, I guess, and I, I and that's the fight that you're fighting right now, is with um, something that's gotten out of hand. So we've only got a little bit of time left. So tell us how people can follow what the Pacific Legal Foundation does. You guys do great work. I like to have you guys on as often as I can on the show because you do awesome uh, constitutional protection work and um, you know smart people when it comes to the Constitution. So tell people. Where do they follow you? How do they keep up on all that stuff you do? Uh, so the easiest way is just to go to our website, uh, pacificlegal.org, where you can sign up for email list or, or learn more about all of our cases. But we're also on all of the major social media um, programs. So you can find us on Facebook under Pacific Legal and on Twitter under at Pacific Legal. Tremendous. Um, well, Jonathan, I want to thank you for taking your time to be here today. This is important stuff, and uh, you guys do great work. And I think it's important that people not look at this as just a fishing case, but that you look at it as a government stepping outside of its authority case. And if they can do it to these fishermen, they can do it to you. And uh, so we're grateful to have you guys fighting the good fight and uh, protecting our rights. Well, thanks again, and thanks again for having me. Absolutely. We're coming to you live on the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. And, of course, we are around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, TalkStream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, 
iHeartRadio and AMFM 24 7. Do not go away. We'll be right back. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can lead, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. I want to remind our listeners, if you would like to hear a rebroadcast of today's show... You should check out our websites, ccrsnetwork.com and ccrshow.com. And, of course, you can always go to rednationrisingradio.com and redstatetalkradio.com to get the latest of the conservative commandos. And you know what? You do not even need a computer or a radio to listen to conservative commandos. You just need a phone and this number, and you can call and listen to us, 832-999-1199. As Rick says, we're everywhere. We are everywhere. There is no excuse for missing out and ever missing a single word of the conservative commandos. So now I get to introduce our next guest, a friend of uh, the conservative commandos radio program, You uh, have heard him before. I'm sure you've enjoyed him because he not only talks uh, reasonableness but he uh, and and sense, but he tends to do it in a way that it it just uh, you you find it uh, interesting, amusing, and and insightful. Uh, That's Seton Motley. He is the uh, 
founder and president of Less Government and um, a uh, solid conservative and somebody who, if you follow what he writes, you're going to be better informed for having done that. Seton, <laughs> welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. I appreciate the kind intro. Thank you very much. Um, you have uh, done a lot of work on net neutrality. Um, just to bring our listeners up to speed, just quickly synthesize what this issue is about. Why? I mean, after all, neutrality is probably a good thing, right? You know, no, yeah, but, it's, but, and, and the Affordable Health Care Act is a good thing, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, affordable Health Care. It's, it's, Obama, it's Obamacare. It's socialism for the Internet. It guarantees everyone equal amounts of nothing. Um, we've actually got a guy on the record, a college professor and an avowed Marxist. Please pardon the redundancy. And he has literally written, not said, written, that the ultimate objective of network neutrality is to eradicate the media and to divest them from control. How very Venezuela of them. What the ultimate objective is, is to eradicate all the private sector Internet service providers, Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, Time Warner, etc., and have government be your sole Internet service provider. And, of course, at that point, that's when a free market problem becomes a free speech problem, because when they start rationing bandwidth, who's going to get the bandwidth? Is it going to be NationalReview.com, or is it going to be uh, DailyCoast.com, et cetera, et cetera? As we know from the IRS scandal, they do choose who gets what from the government. Right. Now, that's a very good point. Um, you know, I see the uh, Internet has been a, a very positive thing. It's, one of the, it's the only thing I like about Al Gore. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, the, the reality is I can remember when I first started off working for a think tank, we spent most of our budget on paper, ink, binding, and mailing of those items. Today, right. we spend almost nothing on those sorts of things because the reality is the Internet is a way to broadcast. The Internet's a way to publish. And as a result, we can put more money into content. And um, right. – it seems to me it's been a way to, if you will, democratize or make it so that the common man can publish, can broadcast, etc. That's a good thing, but I think there's lots of people, particularly those who have kind of big government views, who see that as a, not a good thing. They think it's like right. Oh, it made but- the it made the first it made the First Amendment completely horizontal. I mean, anybody can go to WordPress or uh, you know Blogger or you know these other websites and get a free website, and then if your content enters the marketplace of ideas and, you know, you market it well or, it, you know, it gets, it, it, it's good content and it can spread like wildfire instantaneously for free. No publishing, as you said, no printing, no mailing, none of that. Um, it's a fa- and, of course, what happened was it got, uh, got ahead of the left. It grew so fast, so quickly, that the, the left didn't have a regulatory hook in it to reel it back in. And that's what net neutrality is. It's that regulatory hook to reel it back in under their control. And so I don't want any part of it. Now, there's – just to be clear, and this is why it's so pernicious, there are some aspects of net neutrality that were the original four principles, which really aren't that bad. It's, it, it, and I oppose them because I think they're unconstitutional, but the ISPs don't oppose them. They're like no blocking. Like, for example, just to give you an example, one of the arguments for net neutrality is, oh, my gosh, when Comcast and NBC merged, and I know everyone listening going, oh, my God, that's two left-wing companies. It is, but we believe in these principles for everybody. But when they, when Comcast and NBC merged, the argument from the net neutrality freaks was, oh, they're going to block you from going to CBS and ABC.com because they're owned by NBC and they want you to be going to NBC.com. Well, guess how many times that happened? Zero. Uh, because, again, we're, we understand how the free market works. These people are in the customer service business. If they stop servicing their customers, they won't be in business. So nobody blocks anybody. And so the, the no blocking principle is one of the four principles of net neutrality, the original net neutrality that they don't have a problem with. And right now there's legislation in Congress. Because, again, that's one of the other aspects of this that's so obnoxious. This has been imposed by a unelected bureaucratic agency which didn't get any legislation telling them to do it, which means it's completely unilateral fiat with no 
constitutional backing whatsoever. So there's a bill in Congress to do these original four principles, no blocking, uh, you know, just simple stuff that none of these companies do anyway, because, again, the free market dictates that they don't. Um, and th th that legislation, of course, is being proposed by Republicans, and the Democrats won't touch it with a 10-foot pole because they much prefer the total radical power grab by the Obama administration in 2015, and they would rather, even though the Trump administration is on the, in the process of undoing it, they would rather sue and try to keep those uh, that power grab in place rather than the much more reasonable, uh, you know, limited net neutrality that the uh, original net neutrality was, that the original freaks said was all they wanted, and of course it's never all they wanted. Um, and and, and that, that's where we are now. Is If you see a bill from the Republicans on net neutrality, don't freak out on them because they're correct. What they're trying to do is kill the issue for the left in a very limited fashion, which is almost completely innocuous to the free market Internet. It will do almost no damage at all. And, for, you know, for, from legislation from D.C., that's a pretty high praise. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so oh. that's, that's where we are with this, is you've got two tracks happening. You've got the, the Trump FCC undoing the Obama FCC's huge power grab, and then to try to kill the issue once and for all, there's legislation. And, and by the way, through the right channels, through our elected representatives, not through bureaucratic agencies. You have the Republicans in the House offering a bill that, that, that is net neutrality the way they originally defined it. And, you know, if you hear net neutrality from the Republicans in the, in, the, in, the, in the House, don't yell at them. They're actually doing a very smart thing, both policy-wise and politically. So, you know, uh, you're going to hear that you're trying, oh, my God, that's terrible. No, 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 they're doing the right thing. This is a, it's a smart play both policy-wise and polit uh, politics-wise. We've only got about a minute left in this segment, but the, just real quickly, the regulatory agency is trying to ram this down our throat. Uh, let our listeners kind of know who that is and, and, and what the game is. Okay, there's the Federal Communications Commission is who did this. This agency probably shouldn't exist anymore. Um, you know, as a former commissioner, Republican Commissioner Rob McDowell said, we don't have a federal clothing commission telling you how many buttons to put on a shirt. Um, they, 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 they pretty much outlasted their usefulness. There's a couple things they still do that could very easily be farmed out to other agencies with no problem whatsoever. But what they did was it's, it's five commissioners, one of whom acts as chairman. And it's three of the president's party and two of the other. So, of course, under Obama, it was three to two Democrat, and that's when they jammed this. And then, it, and, it, and now it's three to two Republican, and they're trying to undo it. Excellent. And they are going to undo it because they have a three to two advantage. Right. Um, well, that's good news. <laughs> We've got to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. But before we go, I want to remind you that you are listening to us on the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. And, of course, many of you are listening around the world on the Internet. I might add Al Gore's amazing Internet. With American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeart Radio, and AMFM 24-7. Whatever you do, don't go away because we will be back. And Seton and I will continue this conversation about net neutrality and everything since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the United Action of Prayer which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. We would like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home? on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory. Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? 
Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do. And join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can leave, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Schrader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. We're going to continue that conversation that we were having with Seton Motley, the president of less government and an expert on net neutrality and um, and how the government at times has tried to wrestle the uh, control of the Internet from itself, uh, from you and us and the free market for itself. But before we do that, I just want to remind you that if you want to hear rebroadcast of today's show, if you missed a word that you can't believe you missed and want to hear it again, Check out our websites, ccrsnetwork.com, ccrshow.com is the other one. You can also go to Red Nation Rising Radio and Red State Talk Radio, both .coms. And with your phone and this number, you can always listen to the conservative commandos, even without a computer and even without a radio. 832-999-1199. Seaton, before the break, we were talking about the FCC and how um, under Obama they ran through th- these uh, net neutrality principles um, or th- these regulations, um, and now they're in the process of being done, undone. And we also talked about how Congress is putting forth kind of a benign version to, to kind of kill the issue and, and, and take the field, so to speak, as opposed to leaving right. it. Um, 
what's what do you see as um, the risk to the average listener? You know, someone's listening in. Many of our listeners, obviously, are on the internet, and um, the internet gets controlled all of a sudden. I think you're right. Just like with the IRS, uh, you know, conservative commandos, Seton Motley, George Landreth, we don't have the same access to that we used to have. So no, that's exactly right, and and. You know, it's, it's rare with regulation. Obamacare was kind of a weird exception. It was so bad so fast that the average American could draw a straight line between the regulation and the damage done to the private sector. Usually, it, 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 there's, a, there's a lag time, right? And that allows the left to, issue, to impose something. Then, they, then, they, then it screws up the private sector, and then they come back and say, oh, see, the private sector isn't working. We need more government, when, of course, the original sin was the first regulation in the first place. Um, net neutrality works that way. Net neutrality, and, these, and especially one important point is not only did they impose net neutrality, they went back in time and imposed 1934 landline phone line law onto the Internet. Monopoly landline phone law. So you can imagine the, the incredible uh, pertinence of 1934 landline phone law to the 21st century Internet. From a, you know, how, how's that going to work from a regulatory standpoint? What's that going to do to the speed and the, and the continued growth of the Internet with those you know, century-old laws applied to it? So what, what, what's going to happen with the, if these things stay in place? The Internet's not going to go from 60 miles an hour to zero miles an hour. It's going to go from 60 to 55, and then it's going from 55 to 50, 50 to 45. It's kind of like the cars in Cuba. You've seen those cars in Cuba. In the 1950s, they were great. Now they're held together with chewing gum and bailing wire. Right. And that's what would happen to the Internet. They, the net neutrality would completely demolish. It would, it would eviscerate the profit of every ISP. And as we know from every entrepreneur that has any money to invest, are they going to invest in something when they know they can't get a return on their investment? No. So they'll all go away. And then the internet starts to decay and get slower. And so not only does it stop advancing, it starts regressing. And that's the, that's the point. And that's what now, that gets us back to, the, to Robert McChesney, the college professor, who said the ultimate objective is to eradicate the media capitalists and dive control. You regulate them to such an extent that they don't make any more money. They stop investing in the – they get out of the business. They'll get out of the business of being Internet service providers, and then you're left with government as your sole Internet service provider. Because, of course, and they that's why you saw a pair- in the void, right? Right, and, and, and they, they, were, they were already doing that Obamacare. because while they were – well, yes, and and while they, they were while they were doing this at the FCC under Obama, they were also ramping up the money for government broadband, for you know the, the county, uh, you know the city of Ch- Chattanooga, Tennessee, to get in the broadband business to compete with Comcast and Time Warner and whomever. Which you know, a it's first of all it's obnoxious because you're taking tax money from a company to fund a competitor to that company. And I just find that to be highly obnoxious. Second of all, of course, the government is never going to keep up with the investment necessary. You know, hello, here we are with a huge gas tax at the federal level, and we're still talking about a trillion-dollar infrastructure bill because they haven't kept up with the roads. Right. And, and now we're going to put them in charge of funding an Internet program? No, thank you. So <laughs> they, they tried right. to ramp – yeah, they, they tried to ramp up. They were ramping up what I call government broadband, you know, the government getting into the broadband business. And that's, that's, of course, a terrible idea. But that's the other track, like I said. As they regulated the private providers out of the business, they were ramping up the government alternative to it. Interesting. Now, do you see this as something that um, we're out of the woods on because with the election of Trump and ha- him ha- now having Well, the no, authority? because once, you know, th- there's going to be a conga line to the courtroom once. Th- th- look, right now, the head of the FCC is a guy by the name of Ajit Pai. That's who he was. A, he was a commissioner under Obama. So he knows where all the regulatory bodies are buried. And he's doing, he's a very smart guy. He doesn't like net neutrality. He doesn't like the reclassification. And what he's doing is he's going through this slow, laborious process because he's, in his legal judgment, he's doing it the way, best way possible to keep it from being dumped and overturned in court. 
But as soon as he finishes this process, there are a bunch of leftists are going to sue. And then who knows what judges we're going to get, right? Because we've spent decades, the Senate has spent decades not doing its advising consent correctly when it comes to federal judges. And so I'm, my concern now isn't a policy one, it is, and it isn't a vote one at the FCC, because I know the outcome of that. My concern rests with, okay, when they sue, where do they, what, what ridiculous judge do they get that's going to make some absurd ruling based on their personal policy preferences rather than the law as written? Uh, you make a very good point there. One of the things that uh, concerns me is we have regularly seen – um, judges uh, approved, you know, I mean, they, they get ratified and, and, and moved on and, and, and they sit on the bench. And we knew at the moment they were voted on that they were going to violate the not, not, For example, neither Kagan nor Sotomayor should be on the Supreme Court. Right. We neither knew one the, of them. We knew at the moment they were, I mean, the day they were nominated, we knew that the right. purpose was to violate the, their oath of office. To right. denigrate the rule of law and to ignore the Constitution. That's what they were and, and they've done. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example right off the bat, Kagan was the Solicitor General arguing for Obamacare. She should not have been allowed to vote on Obamacare. She should have recused herself. But right. she didn't recuse herself, and that was, a, that was the 5 4 vote. Right. Now, that's an interesting point. Um, do you have any uh, words of wisdom? You mentioned the House bill, for example, that they're working on. That's the, the benign version. It's trying to kind of essentially disembowel. To so just kill this issue. Frick, kill. Yes. Just frick. Who are the sponsors? Yeah. Who's involved? Um, there, there's, it's, it's, it's telecom people on the, on the House Communications, uh, co- excuse me, House Commerce. Uh, it's okay. Greg Wal- I think I don't know if Greg Walden's on it, but he's the head of the committee. Okay. So just look at the House, House and Senate Commerce Committee. Um, I think jo- oh, John Thune in the Senate, I think, is leading the charge in the Senate. But it's a reasonable bill. Don't get mad at them when you hear you hear that, you know, because rightly we've been decrying net neutrality for a decade now. Right, right. But 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 this is a smart play. Uh, by the House Republicans and the Senate Republicans. So when you hear that Republicans talking about a net neutrality bill, of course your initial reaction is going to be, oh my God, don't, no, they're right. They're right on this. So get behind them when they bring it up, please. Excellent. Well, Satan, you've been very helpful. Uh, tell folks how they can uh, follow up with... Um, oh yeah, please, yeah, just please go to, you know, just go to lessgovernment.org. You can actually sign up for our newsletter. You, I'll only email you when, when we write something. And unlike Google, we won't sell the data. That's great, Seton. Thanks so much. We really appreciate you sharing your perspective with us and getting us up to date. Since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the United Action of Prayer which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. We would like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home? on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory. Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. 
Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do. And join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can lead, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Schrader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome to the Conservative Commandos. We are glad you tuned in. Uh, today, I will be joined. This is George Landreth, and uh, Rick Trader will not be with us, but I have with me Travis Corson. And um, you, uh, those of you who are regular listeners to Conservative Commandos will, will uh, certainly recognize his, his voice and name. And um, I know we've got a great show for you today. I want to remind everybody that um, you can uh, listen to us just about everywhere. You can listen to us in, uh, in Florida, in Georgia, in Wisconsin, California, uh, Nevada, and Pennsylvania on uh, your typical uh, broadcast radio. Tune in your radio in the car or if you still have one on the uh, mantle in the, in the family room. But, of course, you can also listen to us on the Internet as well and even with your phone. So you never have an excuse for missing the conservative commandos. But let's jump right in, uh, Travis. Uh, it's good to have you with us. And, uh, of course, welcome to Conservative Commandos. I appreciate you being the co-host today. Glad to be back with you, George, and back with the Conservative Commandos. It's, it's always a good conversation when I'm here. Let's, um, let's jump in a little bit as to some things that have been going on around the world. Um, you know, with, the, with Houston uh, underwater, I thought it was interesting to listen to the left essentially try to uh, tie all this to climate change. And they started talking about 100-year floods and saying that there's too many 100-year floods in the last, you know, 15 years. I think she said something like there were six or seven of them in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, and I thought it was kind of a funny conversation because it seems to me they're missing the point of what that, all, what that means. And they're kind of preying upon people not knowing enough to know that they're basically feeding us a line. 
Did you notice that much in coverage? Well, uh, yeah, and, and uh, George, one of the things that, that the left does now, whenever there is an extreme weather event, no matter what the nature of the weather event is, be it hot, cold, drought, rain, it's all due to climate change. And, uh, and there's been this concerted effort over the last couple of years to peg any sort of extreme weather event to, to climate change, which, which is disingenuous, or so-called climate change is there for the rest, which, is, which I find disingenuous in, in, in a number of different ways. Um, I, I mean, furthermore, you know, when we look at and we talk about things like 100-year floods, and, and, and you can get into what some of the statistics uh, on, on that actually mean uh, uh, and, uh, and what that word actually means, but it's important to note that we're really only looking, when we stack and measure, measure weather, we're really only looking at it through a lens of about 140 or 150 years. Um, modern or what we would deem modern kind of weather measurements really didn't start until the late 1800s. So to talk about some of these things and, and talk about historical trends, we're really looking at a, at a relatively small window compared to the overall uh, time that, that Earth has been around as well. That's a very good point. You know, the other thing that I think is funny, of course, is the, hundred, the phrase 100-year flood um, is essentially a, an attempt to create a, um, essentially a mathematical probability. They don't mean that you'll only have one of these every 100 years. It actually means there's a 1% chance in any given year that you'll have such a flood. And, um, and so then they use the term 100-year flood because obviously if you have a 1% chance um, over a, you know, at, at any given time period, then over 100 of those time periods you might in fact experience, and you might not, and you might experience four times. Um, it's just kind of an odd uh, thing. What I noticed they didn't talk about is that we haven't had any, um, what do you call it? Um, what, the last landfall that was a big deal was Katrina and the one that came right after Katrina. And I'm tr- not remembering that off the top of my head. But that's 2005. So for 12 years, we've had not a single major storm that in uh, you know, a hurricane hit uh, the U.S. Um, I think Sandy uh, doesn't quite qualify because, as I recall, it was more of a, a nor'easter. But at any rate, from a hurricane perspective, what you see is um, actually less. I, mean, I don't know if you remember, but when when we had uh, Katrina, Al Gore said, "This is the new normal. This is going to happen all the time." And now, twelve years later, we. Um, you know, haven't had a single one of those. And now, of course, the one thing in Houston is evidence of climate change. So it's kind of like they're always wrong, but they're never willing to talk about how they're wrong. They always go on to some new factoid. It's a little annoying. Well, um, I don't know if you've been following, uh, since we're trying to get around the world pretty quickly, let's jump over to Iran real quick. Of course, we've got this ridiculous uh, nuke deal with them. My understanding is now the inspectors are being told they can't go to military bases. Um, yeah. At least there's certain military bases they can't go to, and uh, it seems to me that's a violation of the uh, of the. We're supposed to be able to inspect. Yeah, well, uh, just before we, we move on to the segment, I just wanted to close out uh, our discussion about the, the historic hu- flooding in Houston by just saying um, my thoughts and prayers are with all of the folks uh, that were affected by that tragedy. Um, I know I personally will be donating to one of the numerous uh, reputable charities that are down there providing disaster relief. And and as they are financially capable, I would certainly encourage our, our listeners to do so as well, because it, it's certainly going to be something that uh, that they'll be facing for years to come. And, and anything we can do to help them, I'm sure, will be sorely needed down there. But um, yeah, you moving make a very on, good point. That's uh, if, and just to follow up on that, if you look at kind of the. The floodwaters will, will subside at some point. You know, this time next week, there won't be uh, standing water everywhere. I mean, a lot of it will be gone, but the damage and the wreckage and the destruction will be there. I mean, most of these homes that you see will be completely uninhabitable. They'll have to gut them. And uh, people are going to be in a, in a real difficult spot, not for a week or two or three or even a month or two or three. This could be something that takes uh, you know years to dig out of. And... Um, 
many people will be starting over. So you make a very good point not to just discuss this as a news uh, thing, but to really focus in on the the impact on people. It's going to be a big deal, and we ought to do everything we can to help. Um, whether it's you know go down and be helpful with our hands or send some cash to to help, but you're right. That's an important message. But uh, but but move, moving on to kind of back to the the, the topic uh, at hand, um, Iran and, and the nuclear deal. I, I, I mean this this is a this is a deal that has had holes in it since the beginning, in my opinion. The the previous administration, the previous president, was so desperate to form a deal that they were willing to make concessions and overlook violations uh, for for years. And and now there's a new sheriff in town, and and. They are merely trying to exercise and use the enforcement mechanisms that are necessary in order to make sure there is no cheating going on in the deal. And, uh, and, and this is what we're running into. It, it seems to me, George, eerily similar to Saddam Hussein and the WMD inspections that we saw in the lead up to the, to the Iraq war uh, and, and, um, and his recalcitrance to let, uh, to let the inspectors in. Yeah, you make a very good point. This was a a bad deal to start with. So I would argue even if the Iranians uh, lived up to every term, it's not a good agreement. But there were probably nobody who had any sense at all actually thought they were going to live by every term of that agreement. And what we see is that's actually the the case. Um, It's not surprising because I think, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say trust but verify. Um, I think... um, you know, Barack Obama's, um, his mantra must have just been, yeah, trust him, no worries. And <laughs> you see what we get out of that. And, uh, and like you said, there's a new sheriff in town, and he's uh, obviously more from the uh, trust but verify approach. And so I don't, I don't know how this all resolves itself, but it is an interesting problem. We have an agreement with Iran that guarantees they will have nuclear weapons within a decade. They could have them sooner, but it guarantees they'll have them within a decade. Um, that's not a good deal. And they're not even living up to the agreement. And that makes it an even worse deal. I, I uh, yeah, I, it I agree. It's, it's, overly con- I mean, it's, a, it's concerning the thought of Iranians having nuclear weapons to begin with. But when you look at the fact that they aren't patient enough to wait a mere 10 years in order to, to legally ramp up that, their nuclear program, what does that bode for what? when the restrictions are lifted on their program and what it's going to look like in an unrestricted environment. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And like you said, they fund all sorts of terrorism around the globe and, and create trouble. So now once they have nuclear weapons, that's not going to be a pretty picture. It's going to be bad stuff. Well, we've got to take a quick break, um, but I just want to remind everyone that we are coming to you on the Conservative Commandos radio network and, of course, around the world on the Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, TalkStream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, iHeartRadio, AM, FM, 24-7. Don't go away. Travis and I will be right back after these messages. Since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the United Action of Prayer, which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. We would like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home, on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory? Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. 
Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do. And join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Angle, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can leave, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Trader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. This is George Landreth, and I'm with Travis Corson. We are uh, filling in as the Conservative Commandos today, um, but I want you to know that if you would like to hear rebroadcast of today's show, check out our website, CCRS Network and CCR Show, both dot coms. And at 11 a.m., you can always get the most recent uh, Conservative Commandos uh, program by going to rednationrisingradio.com. At midnight, you can go to lo- you can log on to redstatetalkradio.com. And you know what? You don't have to have a radio. You don't have to have even a computer. You can just call on your phone and listen to the Conservative Commandos by calling 832-999-1199. It goes to show you we truly are everywhere, and there's never an excuse for missing a single episode. Well, Travis, um, we were just talking about uh, Iran. The other kind of crazy bad actor, uh, at least one of the other crazy bad actors in the world, North Korea, Kim Jong-un, uh, this week shot a uh, missile over uh, the airspace and over the, the island of Japan. That sounds relatively provocative to me. I'm trying to figure out how Americans would respond if someone shot a missile over top of America. It, it you know, flew right on by and doesn't hit anything in America. But would we think that was cool or would we be upset? Well, I, I, I would certainly be upset and I think any of our allies would be upset. I, I, I think it's important to put this launch in context. 
Uh, the North Koreans, since, uh, since the election, or especially since the inauguration of President Trump, have really significantly ramped up their program. This was the 18th, that's right, the 18th uh, missile test that, they, that North Korea has had this year. Uh, they are, so they are significantly ramping up their program with an eye towards, number one, developing missiles with a range long enough to hit all of mainland, uh, you know, all the mainland United States, all of the lower 48, and then also miniaturizing uh, a nuclear warhead that, it, that would be small enough to uh, to put on one of these uh, one of these missiles. Uh, now, Hawaii and Alaska and good good portions of the West Coast, uh, a lot of observers are, are fairly confident uh, are in North Korean range with existing technology. And um, the East Coast of the United States uh, theoretically is. They're still, they're, that's still a little bit more disputed as to the range of their, their missiles. But the, 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 it, what's concerning is not only the fact that the, the frequency of these tests has increased, but the timeline uh, with which North Korea is expected to possess this technology just a, just a matter of months ago was a five-year timeline. Now it's a matter of a year uh, before they'll have that technology. So they are ramping up. They are displaying increasing aggression. Um, and the threat is becoming more real by the day with every test. You know, I think it's a problem to, um, you know, when you have someone like um, Korea, Iran, these are essentially these irresponsible, uh, really just kind of, I don't want to be too... Uh, a melodramatic, but the reality is um, it's these are evil people. These are people that uh, mistreat their own people, kill them. Uh, I just, you know, to, I guess it's important that we recognize this. I'm not terribly upset that England or France have nuclear weapons, um, but there are some people on the planet that really shouldn't have them because they've demonstrated. It's a little bit like you know, I have a neighbor who's a law-abiding citizen. If he owns a handgun, I'm not real worried. But if there's somebody who's a convicted felon that's, you know, been violent most of their life, I'm much less excited about them, you know, loading up with weapons and firearms. And that's why our laws don't let felons own guns. This is the same idea, basically. International felons, international thugs, murderers, ought not have these sorts of weapons. And yet... Um, they are aggressively pursuing them. And I, I, I think there's a logic to it. Um, you know, I think Kim Jong-un understands that as, as soon as he enters the, the nuclear family, as it were, internationally, and has one, um, he becomes somebody that cannot be uh, gotten rid of. You know, we, people like uh, Saddam were gotten rid of. People like Gaddafi were gotten rid of. I don't know that getting rid of Gaddafi made sense, quite frankly, because he was actually trying to help us at that point. He'd kind of, you know, put the fear of God was put into him, and I think he decided to stop funding and supporting and so forth. But we did it anyhow. So what it, that message that sent to me is if you're North Korea, don't give up your weapons uh, programs. Quickly develop them um, because if you give them up in a few years, some, uh, you know, idiot president like um, – Obama or some idiot Secretary of State like uh, Clinton will, uh, even if you're being helpful to them, will will essentially you know, hunt you down and kill you. Um, and yet, of course, they do nothing about the guys that are actually the problem. I thought that was a very weird message, but it sent the wrong message. And so I, I think I understand why Kim Jong-un has accelerated, as you pointed out, his uh, drive to obtain a credible nuclear threat. It's because he feels like once he's got that, he's protected. Until he has that, he feels at risk. And if he gives it up, there's no way he'll give it up. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I, why would he? We've already demonstrated that giving up your, your uh, weapons programs isn't really a good idea. Why would you want to do that? Everybody who's done that, we've killed. <laughs> Well, I, I want to I want to get back to a point that you were making a few minutes ago, just regarding international law and the rule of law, and and uh, you're you're applying it to to your gun analogy, but it also uh, it also applies to 
uh, to to this for this particular instance, in so much as you have a country in North Korea that doesn't really have much, if anything, in the way of respect for international law and international treaties and international agreements and and just agreements between uh, countries. Yeah, they've broken and, every agreement uh, they ever signed. So yeah, I mean. And, they, they don't. They don't care. An agreement to them is something a way for them to get goodies today and renege on the payment for those goodies tomorrow. Yeah, and and so you've got you've got a you know deal maker president that has seen a number of uh, deals made that have been reneged on and have ended up being bad deals for the United States. So there is a there is a need now to recalibrate. Um, how America responds to this threat, which I think you had kind of mentioned at the beginning of the segment. Uh, in my opinion, the best way to respond to that threat now, uh, you know, besides taking uh, measures, uh, what, what few measures we have left at this point uh, diplomatically to try to stem the growth of, uh, of the program, of, of North Korea's missile program, and especially their nuclear program, is to make sure we're investing in and developing the countermeasures to these missile threats, these airborne threats, specifically in the form of missile defense. Uh, if you've seen, uh, we have been uh, on the West Coast in, in, uh, in Alaska and California, but especially in Alaska, we have been adding more interceptors for some of these long-range North Korean missiles that could potentially hit the American mainland. Um, in uh, South Korea, we were able to put an additional THAAD battery in, which is another missile defense system, uh, before the new president came in. We're now talking about ways to bolster the defenses of Hawaii and Guam against some of these, ma- these medium-range uh, missile threats in North Korea. So that really, every time that North Korea launches another missile test, it underscores the need and the importance to make sure we're making the necessary investments in these systems that allow us to shoot down incoming North Korean missiles and protect our population and our American citizens from that threat. You make a very good point. The, uh, the, the ability to defend ourselves is critical, and the ability to um, stop incoming missiles is critical. And unfortunately, during most of Obama's uh, time in office, he was downgrading that as a priority canceling uh, a new installation of a new uh, missile interceptor b- uh, base and so forth and, and the, the, the high-tech radars that go along with it. And uh, it seems to me that uh, this president understands the importance. If you're the president of the United States, you do want to be able to block incoming missiles and stop them. For some reason, uh, Obama just didn't believe that was a serious threat. And it's unfortunate that he was that short-sighted. But, but on a practical basis... Um, we have to have a robust missile defense system. And it has to be a layered system. Sometimes people say, oh, why do we need the THAAD? And why do we need a ground-based missile, you know, mid-course defense? Why do we need all these? That's just duplicative. And the answer is it's not actually duplicative. They're defending against different risks and different types of missiles. And it's important that we be able to defend against all of them, not just some of them. One of the few, very few things the Constitution explicitly outlines is providing for the common defense. And making sure we're defending against threats like this is an important part of carrying out one of those constitutionally charged duties. It's job number one for the federal government. You're exactly right. We're coming to you on the Conservative Commandos Radio Network and, of course, around the world on Al Gore's amazing Internet with American Patriots Broadcasting, Talk Stream Live, SHR Media, K98 Talk, AMFM 24-7, iHeartRadio. We are everywhere. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the United Action of Prayer which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. We would like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home? on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory. Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. 
Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do. And join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can leave, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Schrader. The Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. This is George Landreth with Travis Corson, your co-host today. Uh, Rick Trader, as uh, you might have guessed, isn't here today. Don't worry. He will be back. We have not performed any sort of coup. Uh, Just filling in for him uh, with his permission. Uh, Even uh, someone as committed as Rick is entitled to a little time off every now and then. I want to remind you, you can always hear a rebroadcast of today's show. Lots of good information. Maybe you got a call. Maybe you had to step away for a moment. Don't worry. You can always... uh, get those rebroadcasts, just check out our websites, ccrsnetwork.com, ccrshow.com. You can also go to rednationrisingradio.com and redstatetalkradio.com. And, of course, with your phone and this number, you can always listen to the, uh, the program, 832-999-1199. Before I go back to Travis, I want to introduce our two guests for the show. We are going to be talking later in the show with Jonathan Wood, who is with the Pacific Legal Foundation. You may have heard in the news about President Trump 
demanding or requiring the, the uh, government to take a look at these monument designations, these huge land grabs that occurred in the uh, previous decade or so. And uh, he'll have some information on that. should be very interesting. He's filed a lawsuit against one of these monument designations um, that occurred during the Obama years. And fortunately, the president seems to be uh, working on doing something about it. Our, uh, our second guest is uh, Seton Motley of Less Government. He is going to talk to us about the net neutrality debate, uh, the whole concept of during the Obama years and even before how the left wanted to get their hands on and regulate and control the Internet. And um, he will also talk to us a little bit about what Congress is doing that is kind of smart to take the wind out of the left sails and prevent them from doing that. So, Travis, we ought to go to this next topic. The president's been quietly working with Congress to figure out what to do. Um, I think there's kind of – it's an issue that has two different levels, really. One is a rule of law level, which the Obama administration, just through executive order, basically tried to make a, a law that I, I don't think it's permitted to do. Um, and that would be true whether you agree or disagree with the law. We could have a you know, president making law that everyone should give their mother uh, on her birthday and on Mother's Day some roses – and while that might be something we could all say is a good idea, I'm not sure it's the president's place to mandate that. DACA is probably a little more, um, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting debate because while most people are concerned about illegal immigration, this is really a function of people who were born and raised in America. Their parents came here illegally with them when they were, in many cases, infants or small. Um, and so it's a little more, um, if you will, um, understandable as to why we should work something out here, even if you're a relatively, if you will, hardliner on, it, on illegal immigration. And I, I consider myself a hardliner on illegal immigration. I want us to have a system that doesn't permit any illegal immigration uh, going forward because I feel like if you can sneak into America to get a, a decent job, you can sneak into America to kill us. But at the same time, we have people who've lived here now for, you know, they've, they don't generally even speak the language of their home com country. I knew such a person. Didn't speak Portuguese, only spoke English, spoke it without an accent, was in every way an American but had a problem. They came here as an infant, and their parents didn't have papers for them. So what's up with DACA? Yeah, well, uh, that was a good, good intro, George. Uh, just kind of for your listeners' clarity, DACA – uh, stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This is a policy that was put in place in the last administration. It basically uh, allowed these young dreamers, like many of whom were brought here through no fault of their own, like you had mentioned, to live and uh, legally work in the country. Uh, it did not provide. It does not provide them a pathway to citizenship. It does not even provide them. Uh, permanent legal residency at this point. All, all DACA is is a two-year renewable work permit that allows them to stay here, work in the country, and contribute to the economy. Uh, DACA recipients also are not eligible for Obamacare subsidies, welfare benefits, anything like that. Um, so they really are, uh, for all intents and purposes, net contributors to the economy in a number of different ways. Heck, they, they, also they even need to pay five— records, right? Correct. No criminal record, uh, clean records, and if they have, if, if they commit any sort of a crime while they are here, those that's grounds for immediate deportation. Um, and uh, so they they're they're net economic contributors. Uh, the Cato Institute found uh, that their economic contributions uh, is in the billions uh, in the study that they did. And uh, heck, they even need to pay five hundred dollars every two years to get that permit renewed. So that so there is no t uh, cost to the taxpayer in order to 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 provide those permits and to allow them this opportunity to stay. Now, as far as the 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 me at the end, I think we can. Many of us agree that the end, the opportunity to allow these individuals that want to be here, that want to participate in the economy, that want to become Americans, and for all intents and purposes, like you said, aren't raised American. Um, is 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 a, is a good thing. Um, the means to that end, as conservatives, I think we had a lot of concern about, which was it was done through an executive order from the Obama administration instead of through Congress, which is where things like this need to be done. Now, an interesting fact to note is that Congress was well on its way to passing a legislative solution 
before the president told the Democrats in Congress to stop working with Republicans because he wanted the political win for himself and was concerned that if Republicans were able to pass a piece of legislation, that he would not be able to get, and Democrats would not be able to get the political win. So the president effectively spiked the congressional negotiations that were going on to resolve this situation in order to implement the executive order that stands today. Interesting, um, interesting I, because, I mean, obviously, if Congress had passed the bill um, and the president had signed it, that would be the, the constitutional order of things in that the Congress, with a presidential signature under the Constitution, have the right to make immigration policy. That's the, if you will, the constitutional way to do it. They haven't done anything wrong. They weren't you, – you couldn't even say they broke the law because they didn't – you know, when they're – you know – if they're a two-year-old and they come with their parents on a visa, they didn't choose to overstay the visa. They're, they're just living with their mom and dad, and they don't even know about it. Like the person I knew didn't know they'd overstayed the visa until they went to college, and that's when they found out that they had a visa problem. Congress was doing that. President says, stop that. I want the credit for myself. That's pretty amazing. Correct. Correct. And, and it, it, uh, it, it really is ironic when Democrats accuse Republicans of using immigrants as political pawns. Because that's a perfect example of, of where the previous president very explicitly used them for that purpose. So any, anyways, the president, President Trump, has a very soft spot in his heart for the dreamers. She's called them amazing kids. He's seen, he's seen the way that they've contributed. What, even, even though the president agrees that, that the executive order uh, has limited constitutionality, um, he, wants to, he wants to create a solution for them so that they are not basically out on the street. So the president wants to see Congress fix this, and I think a lot of conservatives would like to see Congress fix this. What has happened and why the president's hand is currently being forced is that 10 state attorney generals uh, have taken it upon themselves to try to force the president's hand on the issue and not give Congress and uh, the administration time to use regular order to solve the issue. They have threatened the, the president, and they have told him that if he does not rescind the executive order by uh, Tuesday, uh, September 5th, that they will take the president to court and they will effectively sue him and force him to defend the Obama law in court. If this, if this uh, rule, if this, uh, if this executive order loses in court or the judge puts a stay, uh, basically what will happen is that uh, two things could happen. Number one, DREAMers who per whose permits are expiring will no longer to be able to get renewals for their permits. But a judge could theoretically in invalidate all of those permits by the stroke, uh, by, by, uh, by an order, uh, which would put these hundreds of thousands, 700,000 plus in limbo. So what some conservatives are saying is asking these attorney generals to stand down with their threat, to give the president time to work with Congress to come up with a solution that is that will be uh, that will be best for everyone, and to give them the time to do this and not rush through it. I, I mean, I can point to several laws that were rushed through in the dark of night because they were put on a timeline, either arbitrary or self-imposed. Um, the health care law is one that comes to mind. Obamacare. They rushed that through as quick as they could, and we've, and we've been dealing with the consequences of it ever since. So the president is publicly agonizing. He wants to help the DREAMers out, but this AG lawsuit is making it much more difficult for the president to do the right thing and to come up with a solution that he finds is, uh, is, is best and effective and, and the best solution for all the parties involved. Interesting developments. Well, we'll see what happens in the coming days. We're coming down the Conservative Commandos Radio Network. Don't go away. We will be right back. Since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the United Action of Prayer, which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. 
we'd like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home, on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory? Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do. And join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can leave, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. One, one. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world on the Internet, we're coming to you live from the CCRS studios. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with your host, Rick Schrader, the Conservative Commandos Radio Show, where the newsmakers go to be heard. This is Congressman Alan West, and you're listening to the Conservative Commando Radio Show. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. You have, of course, uh, me, George Landreth, and Travis Corson as your co-host today. Uh, you'll have Rick back shortly, but um, we're doing our best to keep up the tradition of, uh, of the Conservative Commandos in his absence. I want to remind you, you can always sit here rebroadcast of our show. It's easy. Just check out our websites. Plus, there's all kinds of other good information on our websites anyhow. But ccrsnetwork.com, ccrshow.com. You can always go to rednationrising.com and redstatetalkradio.com. And if you don't have a computer or a radio, all you need is a phone. And you can call 832-999-1199. That's not to call into the show. That's to actually use your phone to listen to the show. Well, um, Travis, you know, we have a, um, uh, the, the president's kicking off his uh, tax plan. Um, we are um, a nation that needs tax reform in a major way. Our corporate tax rates uh, among the highest in the uh, industrialized world. I think it's the highest uh, by a significant amount. We have, you know, Americans taking home less and less pay because the government's taking a bigger and bigger part of it. That, you know, puts a weight on the economy, slows things down. I've heard people criticize the fact that Trump's out trying to talk about this because they say with uh, floods in Houston, we shouldn't be talking about tax reform. It seems to me that perhaps this is a way to help get the economy rolling in a way that makes it so that Houston will get the resources and the help it needs, and it can also help get Houston back to work too. So I'm just puzzled why people think that tax reform is a bad idea. Uh, well, I, I think both parties would agree that tax 
that the tax system is, is broken. You had mentioned we have the highest corporate tax rate in the OECD. Even the social democracies of Europe have, have tax rates that are on average 10 percentage points lower than that of our corporate tax rate here in the United States. And as, as, as an effect, it has hurt our competitiveness. Um, our, this president is very concerned about um, you know, keep moving jobs back to America, about competing internationally, about bad trade deals. Well, one of the ways in which we can, we can bring jobs back to America, we can compete internationally, we can encourage companies to come back to America instead of uh, going overseas and, and taking, taking jobs with them, is by fixing that corporate tax system and creating an environment that is competitive with the rest of the world from a taxation standpoint. And that will go a long way uh, to, to, uh, to helping the president carry out his promise of bringing jobs back to America and encouraging uh, you know, more economic manufacturing and, 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 and American uh, innovation um, you know, in, our, in our country. So That's an interesting point. So how do we go from the um – how do we go from the idea of uh, getting a tax reform through? Because we've had this problem where I think most Americans would agree that the Affordable Care Act's not working. Uh, I think the facts demonstrably show that. It's no longer a political debate. It's just you can either kind of agree the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, or you can deny that if you'd like. But um, And I would say tax is the same way. So how do we get this one through um, Congress, where it seems Democrats, kind of like the old the thing we were talking about earlier with the uh, uh, immigration, where the president basically, uh, Obama, tried to shut it down because he didn't want them to get credit for anything. You know, it seems now Democrats are playing the same game. They're shutting things down because they don't want Republicans or Trump to get credit for anything. So how are they going to work around that problem, I guess is my point. Well, the president, the president uh, in this Missouri speech and, and a couple other times up to this point has painted with broad brushstrokes kind of what that tax reform will look like, uh, you know, setting out some principles, setting out some goals that they hope to accomplish uh, by, by implementing tax reform. What's going to be important and crucial now is actually going to be seeing some of the brass tax. Uh, what the rates look like, uh, importantly, uh, how they're going to pay for the, the tax cuts, and, and uh, you know, I, 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 would, I believe that most of it will probably be made up in the growth that will come, that 3 percent growth that the president is trying to target, and the growth that will come by getting government off the backs of business and encouraging, um, encouraging uh, and spurring uh, business to, to, to grow. But also, uh, the president's also talking about middle-class tax relief and providing families with more purchasing power to go out there and, and buy goods and stimulate the economy in that way. So um, the, the, the core principles are very good, but I think before we can really see how this will move through Congress and what Congress will do with it, it's on the president and, uh, and the team that he's working with, including his, his, uh, his Treasury Secretary and his National Economic Council, to come out with a plan uh, that uh, – that, uh, is able to to provide for these promises and uh, find a way to, to cover them. You know, one of the interesting things about uh, tax reform is that so often the left wants to pretend that every tax reduction is money out of the pocket of the government, when in fact what Reagan proved was you could reduce taxes and the government would get more money. And people say, how is that possible? And the answer is, the, the, because the economy grew so rapidly that the government got a smaller percentage of a much larger pie. And uh, as a result, their piece of the pie was bigger. And, uh, and of course, so was every American families and Amer American businesses and so forth. Is, is that going to be a sticking point? Is it, because it seems that the liberals never really want to admit that's possible. They always want to act as if um, you cutting taxes is, um, is irresponsible, when in fact it could be the exact right thing to do. Another example would be is how to get all these overseas profits that are just stuck overseas back to America. That could be like a trillion dollar stimulus package that the taxpayers don't actually pay for. It's just a function of uh, fixing our tax code. And all of a sudden, foreign, uh, all these American corporations bring their foreign-earned uh, receipts home, 
and there's a trillion dollars floating around in investment and, and hiring and other things, but yet too many people just, no, no, we're not going to do that. The Bernie Sanders types, they've got to pay their fair share. Well, a lot of, a lot of uh, it comes down to the question of scoring. And um, for, for listeners out there who may not be familiar with scoring, what it is, basically every bill goes uh, to the Congressional Budget Office where they – uh, look at it. They run some analyses and they decide, okay, how much additional revenue will this generate? How much will this contribute to the debt? Um, things of that nature. And um, and um, basically, there are two ways to score. Uh, Democrats generally believe in what's called static scoring. Basically, if you uh, take a smaller percentage of a dollar, then less money is going to come in, and that's going to be that. And there's there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Conservatives generally believe in, in dynamic scoring, which means that because I'm cutting taxes, yes, I won't be getting as high of a percentage, but like you said, the pie will grow because there will be more money. So because the pie will be growing, although I'll be getting a smaller percentage of it, I'm getting a smaller percentage of a, of a bigger amount of money, and therefore will be generating, uh, generating more revenue even though we will be charging people less in the, in the form of taxes and taking less out of their pockets. So that, that'll be a big question as, as the fight goes on and something that I think people are going to need to watch for as Republicans and Democrats spar about the so-called cost of some of these tax cuts. It will definitely be an interesting thing to see. We'll see how this debate plays out. I'm hoping that uh, the members of Congress, uh, particularly the leadership, can uh, – can navigate these uh, tricky waters because they basically have a, a Democratic Party that's doing everything they can to stop them, and they're going to have to be uh, smart enough to get past all that. Some of these l- little landmines that are set up for them. Well, we've got to take a break. We'll be back shortly with our interviews. They'll be very interesting, so don't go away. We're coming on the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, and of course, around the world on the internet. So. You have a million different ways to listen to us. We're glad. Since 2011, we have been calling for a national commitment from all Americans to participate in an annual event to honor all of the victims and their families who suffered during and after the most devastating event to ever take place on American soil. We all remember those horrible scenes of destruction on 9-11-2001 that unfolded right before our eyes, either up front or on television. We continue to ask every American to participate in the United Action of Prayer which is simply to stop whatever you are doing on this and every 9-11 at precisely 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. to either observe one minute of silence or to offer a prayer to honor the memory of those who were directly affected by this unforgettable scene of destruction. Please include a prayer of thanks for living in a country where even something as horrific as 9-11 could not weaken our spirit. We would like to ask one more thing. As a show of unity, since we are still fighting with the enemy who caused the 9-11 tragedy, would you display the flag for the day at your home? on your car, bike, or anywhere you can display old glory. Let's show our enemies that we can still unite in our love for our country. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not from government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and for their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty Health Share and take back control of your health care while helping those around you. Call us at 855-58-LIBERTY for more information or check us out online at libertyhealthshare.org. That's libertyhealthshare.org. I'm Sharon Engel, and I approve this message. I'm more convinced than ever that a constitutional free market conservative can win even in a battleground state like Nevada. Nevada's Congressional District 2 is a winnable seat where Trump won because these voters embrace the principles of sound governance and constitutional free market conservatism. The reality is the president can leave, but he cannot do it alone. In Congress, we contend with the Republicans who often do not support what the American people mandated on Election Day. 
Republicans in D.C. could lose this golden opportunity, and sadly, the biggest beneficiaries will be the establishment and crony capitalism. America is closely divided with Nevada on the front lines of this ideological battle. June 30th is the FEC fundraising deadline. I need to raise enough money to show that I have support to organize this campaign with literature, travel, media ads, and a small staff. Of course, the larger the amount, the more reticent others will be to challenge me in a contested primary, and the less credible the press attack will be. If you are one of the donors who will send $100 or more by June 30th, we will raise $100,000. That's good. If you give $250 or more, we raise $250,000. That's great. And if you give $500 or more, we raise $500,000. That's excellent. The more we raise in the beginning, the greater the odds are that we win. Please join me on Twitter at Sharon Angle and Facebook. Even though Reed is no longer in charge, the establishment machine lives on to defeat anyone who challenges the status quo of crony capitalism. You can help. Give online at SharonAngle.com or mail a contribution to P.O. Box 17373. Reno, Nevada, 89511. Heard the call to build your small business? Make it happen with a .NET domain name. The place for dreamers for 30 years and counting. Visit KeepDreamingUp.net for tips and advice. Whether you're just getting started or looking to grow, that's KeepDreamingUp.net. 